This is Writers Not Writing, the show where you can get to know your favorite writers and soon-to-be favorite writers by listening to them confess to the ways they procrastinate. Thanks for procrastinating with us. I'm Benjamin Gorman, and the quiet guy behind the glass there is Doug the producer. I write novels and collections of poetry and stuff. Doug tries his best to make me sound better. And each week we have a secret word to listen for. If you catch it, you earn the right to take an extra break at the time of your choosing from whatever is stressing you out. From Not A Pipe Publishing, welcome to Writers Not Writing. Today's secret word is shippo. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today's guest is Rhiannon Held. Rhiannon is a professional archaeologist and writer of speculative fiction. Her Silver Series of Urban Fantasy novels was published as Rhiannon Held, and her Amsterdam Institute Series of Space Opera novellas uh, and award-nominated short fiction was published as RZ Held. She lives near Portland, Oregon, where she works for an environmental compliance firm. She At work, she uses her degree mostly for copy editing technical reports. In writing, she uses it for world building. In public, she'll probably use it to check the mold seams on the wine bottle at dinner. Welcome, Rhiannon. Very glad to have you here today. Thank you very much. So I've been realizing I don't have like a catchphrase that I use to start every show. Do you have an idea for me for what I should say to welcome folks to the show? <laughs> Well, on the um, author's D&D actual play I'm on, we end with, may your roles and your word counts be high. So I'm thinking like with your theme, maybe you should be something like, hey, I hope you all have written nothing since last time or something like that. Yes, some yes, kind some of, kind low of word procrastination count. related. Uh, that's a good yeah. idea. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll workshop that. I like that. <laughs> so uh, as as viewers can already see, we always dress up in costume for the show. And so we came in our full costumes, uh, but the podcast listeners can't see us. So tell us about what, tell everybody on the podcast world what you chose to wear today. Well, um, I had a little bit of a Gladrio vibe, but, you know, also a little bit of um, sort of Claire's, you know, got a little bit of the the sort of the crystals and got a little um, circlet kind of thing. Um, a nice sort of drapey off the shoulder kind of gown, very sparkly, you know, holiday, holiday related. And I figured, you know, we're still we're still in winter. We can still get the the sparkle snow kind of thing going on. Well, and, and uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, the director's editions, that's one of our holiday. I mean, you know, people say, oh, what's your Christmas movie for us? It's the, you know, Lord of the Rings rewatch like that is our, you know. So, yes, <laughs> we have been. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm loving the glowing Galadriel. And and so, you know, to, to, to stick with that theme, I went with this Legolas leather armor the the blonde wig i mean the full on i've got the bow i've got and you would think that the 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 having the quiver of arrows here behind my chair would be the most uncomfortable part but it's not it's the wig glue like this <laughs> blonde long blonde wig uh, i'm wearing and the wig glue is itchy so that will be i'll be thinking about that throughout the show like don't itch at the uh, at the long <laughs> blonde wig i didn't shave off the beard so it's a weird legolas look you know it's a long beard dwarven elven uh, uh kind of mix there uh, folks who are watching are like what is he doing but uh, <laughs> Yeah, folks who are listening on the podcast, long blonde wig and long gray beard. It's a, it's an interesting mix. Uh, so um, I have been really excited to have you on to hear about all that's going on with you this next year. What are your big projects this next year? Oh, so um, I am going to work on another novel. Um, I was shopping one novel around to agents for a while, um, and it doesn't seem like that one's quite right, hitting the right market, the right time for it. So I'm going in sort of in a different direction. Um, so I want to hit that hard. Um, I was doing short fiction. Um, I moved house. Um, and so I was doing short fiction during that. That was yes. <laughs> easier. Um, but I'm looking forward to sort of getting back to um, the, the novel. Um, and then the other thing that I'm putting um, my effort creatively wise into um, is I'm part of an author's TTRPG actual play stream. I mentioned that earlier um, called Dungeon Scrawlers. Um, and so uh, when we're um, in session, kind of one of our seasons, we'll do once a week, get there, do some D&D, &D, think about the real character backstory, that kind of thing. So that that also takes my creative attention. Oh, absolutely. So can you tease a little bit about the novel you're working on without giving too much away? What's uh, what's this one? <laughs> so I, I've started to enjoy giving my novels um, code names. So uh, the code name of the last one was Space Dragons. Um, the code name of this one is Cozy Robots. 
cozy robot i cannot i i don't want to live in a world where space dragons are not popular like why, why is that not getting snapped up space dragons i am all over space dragons i know right yeah let's just so. put that out into the universe to agents and and publishers who are listening space dragons why not space Dra <laughs> but but we're so bad at this so my, my my last novel i thought the big selling point would be uh, there are the like toddler werewolves there are adorable baby werewolf puppies yeah. who are learning to hunt and are lethal and i thought baby werewolves that's going to sell the book and we were at a live event and my partner says to i i over i'm talking to somebody I overhear her say oh and this one's got lesbian vampires and the, the person she's talking to goes, lesbian vampires? And somebody else in another part of the booth goes, lesbian vampires? <laughs> and they literally formed a line and we sold out in like minutes on. Well, there you go. Like, Why didn't I just title it lesbian vampires? <laughs> <laughs> lesbian vampires and baby werewolves. Come on. How could, there you, know. you go. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It's the space dragons. Absolutely. So this whole cozy phenomena is, I mean, it is the rage. So you're, you're, you're hitting it right. But cozy robots sounds like a great twist i just read yeah. um what was the the this uh, uh legends and lattes uh yeah. which uh, if folks have not read it is a lot of fun that is this kind of after the the adventurer's quest uh, uh fantasy novel where now the the uh the barbarian orc starts a coffee shop and it's adorable and uh and there's there's a little bit of uh, a, a romance angle where we're going will they won't they with the barista it's a great great book so uh you know can you i don't i don't want to put you on the spot and have oh, you reveal sure. too much but cozy robots what's where are you going with that so that started actually before legend and lattes got big and i'm like oh okay synergy yes um, oh yeah but uh my mother likes watching Virgin River on Netflix because she read the original one. books. And it's a small town romance. There's a new couple every um, book. It's a small town. You meet all the different people in the town. Each book, different people get paired off. Um, and there's a particular sort of small town vibe that I don't think actually exists in the real world. No. But as somebody who lives in a small town, I will tell you, you don't <laughs> want to date in your small town. Like I met my partner in my town and we always joke about what are the odds that we actually <laughs> met somebody? Because most of the time you're like, I don't want to date anybody here. <laughs> um, so I went with that, the small town vibe. And basically it's um, the Westworld retirement community, not literally Westworld, but yes, that kind yes. of thing. Oh, that's, uh, that's brilliant. Um, and so that like, not all is as it seems, as one might expect. Um, and it gets a little bit of the sort of mystery aspect of like a cozy mystery as they're trying to figure out like what is going on behind the scenes in this small town. Um, but what I really wanted to capitalize was that sort of episode in a bottle, kind of like you just have one set of people and they all have to get along with each other and they're all quirky kind of feel, um, but with robots. Yes. Now are the robots involved uh, potentially involved in romances themselves oh of course <laughs> oh i see i think the idea of like older folks in a nursing home trying to hook up the people who are the staff is a ton of fun and then you add the element of oh and the staff are you know largely robotic and that would just be a delight so yes i i am all over this i think that is a great idea um so you've got a ton you're working on when you are procrastinating, because that's what we're focused on, <laughs> when you're procrastinating, what's been pulling you away in terms of pop culture and keeping you from your work? Um, so I have been catching up on Netflix. Um, over the holidays, they put out uh, Blown Away, which is a uh, holiday edition, which is a glass blowing competition show um, that they've had for a few years. And I didn't realize they'd racked up more seasons. And I saw the holiday one, watched that, and then went and caught up. Um, and so I have been watching people glass blow, which had a synergy. Um, I think that people watching on YouTube can see behind me. I have a couple of um, sort of aqua colored glass floats. Those are quasi historical. They could be as young as from like the 1970s uh, Japanese floats that I bought. I didn't find them. Um, and then I also got um, some new modern artist blown fishing floats um, from Lincoln City, Oregon, when I was visiting there. Um, and, and for folks who are not from here in Oregon, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. Oregonian too, uh, the, the, the history of these floats is really fascinating. These floats are Japanese floats that have traveled on their own from Japan to the Oregon coast, or at least that's where the whole kind of phenomena began. So tell everybody about how this, this, this float thing works. It's really a cool 
kind of backstory. Yeah, yeah, I, I find it fascinating myself. So the years I usually hear are 1910 to 1980 um, for these glass floats, and they would make them in bulk. Um, they would be mostly hand blown, but they would Ooh, blow them real generally, quick. Yeah, they're pretty standard. Yeah, um, and they're pretty thick and they're hollow and they stand up really well. So they put them out on the nets and you'd have, you know, dozens of floats per net because they're these huge nets and they'll get, you know, caught or um, get loose. And so if you think that many, many decades, many, many hundreds of thousands of however many floats sort of going out into the Pacific Ocean. And I was reading something in the museums in Lincoln City that they think that there are some that are just kind of like stuck yeah. in the Pacific Ocean, just like chilling. Um, and then they'll come onto beaches all around the, the West Coast. They'll, um, and people will, you know, pick them up. Sometimes they'll have net attached. Um, the ones I bought have Japanese maker's marks. Um, for whatever factory production facility they were made in. Um, and I just, I find it really fun and fascinating that it's made it all this way. Yeah. Um, and as the guy uh, was packaging them when I bought them, was saying, like, I'm carefully packaging these in bubble wrap for you. But if you think about it, like, it came to me in this, like, big, like, crate with no packaging whatsoever. Right. And and I'm thinking, yeah, like, it survived the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, these are hard. <laughs> I'm not going to drop it, but still, like, they're pretty hardy. Yeah, well, and and so then this started this phenomena where glass blowing artists will make, uh, um, you know, these these floats that are far more intricate than the ones that you know were, were mass produced, and occasionally throughout the year just leave them on the beach in Lincoln City or you know the, they're on the Oregon coast, so you have a higher proportion than just the the, the, the ones that are traveling from Japan uh, on the Oregon coast because some of them are left there intentionally, and so folks will just wander the beaches and occasionally find these beautiful <laughs> glass blown pieces of artwork for free. It's you know which yeah. I think that's one of those parts of Oregon culture that I just love so much. Like here are these artists just going. I think it's cool to share my work with the world. There it is on the beach. Hope <laughs> you find it. And and they're really, really, my my uh, son's got one at his mother's place that he found on the beach. It's very cool. Oh, nice. Yeah, I am. Um, because uh, Lincoln City, like, does its, its messaging very well. Because it's yeah. like, we got these out there. Here's when they might be there. Here's how to look, whatever. So I went on one of those special drop days, but no dice because. Yeah, it's tough. A lot of people also. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> go on special drop days <laughs> yeah but that, yeah that's that's cool so is this show uh i've not seen the show is it set in is it glass blowers in in the pacific northwest or where are they located um i think they're, they're on the the east coast somewhere mm -hmm. i want to say pittsburgh but maybe that was just one of the contestants anyway they have a, a glass blowing shop um but they come from all over there was one woman from eugene um they had people that they bring in from the uk or japan or or sometimes so um, they, they try to pull from a, all over. Um, and, and I like, get like a process kind of competition show yes. or yeah. Okay. So it, they'll, they'll give them, it's, it's like, um, you know, a cooking competition where they're like, okay, yeah. make this, they'll say, um, make a, uh, sculpture that represents like a moment from your childhood. Okay. And so that can go like a ton of different directions. Um, and so they don't tend to say technique, they tend to say like conceptual um, or make us six identical glasses that match uh, raspberry daiquiri or, or um, whatever. Oh, that is very cool. I, 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 I don't want to, you know, reveal too much. So no names involved, but I, I had a friend in college whose brother was a glass blower and just did this beautiful artwork and his kind of way into the profession was he had had a pretty serious drug problem and that got him and then got into recovery and was like well during my time there i learned this skill <laughs> you know like i got into glass and was i was talking to him and he was like yeah there are actually a lot of glass blowers who started off making pipes and then ended up going oh i can do a lot more than this you know and but uh, that now he's that's his full time job is doing this beautiful artwork uh so yeah it, it really is a cool i mean it's amazing what these folks can do within the glass itself it you know they, they, these yeah you can watch it happen objects. yeah it's that that is very fun i'll have to check that out well and you can blow your own lincoln city the glass center there you, which i've um, never done before is, yeah. it, is it reasonably priced or is it pretty spendy as a as a you know activity um I mean, it's, it's 
reasonably placed if you're considering that if you just bought one that another artist had made, right. if you're sort of going in being like, I would like a float. Um, the floats are often sort of $50, $60. Yeah. Um, and the glass experience is sort of like 70, 80, I think, depending on the size of what you're making. Yeah. Um, so very reasonable if you're already thinking in that sort of bracket. Um, so yeah, that oh that that would be a really fun just adventure too for a day. Yeah. You know that that's uh, that's cool. Um, yeah, I should totally. I mean, you know, I think I live about a half an hour away, depending on which way you hey, go. You know, like yeah. it's totally. You know, okay, <laughs> pop over there and and give that a whirl someday. That would be really fun. Um, so, what is a news story that's been pulling you away from your work lately? Um, so <laughs> while I was on vacation, um, obviously I was uh, thinking a lot about um, those the big waves in sort of like Southern central. And then it came Northern California, I think too. Um, so I was sitting, you know, in my hotel um, in Lincoln city, Oregon, right on the beach. Right. Um, I don't think the hotel was in the tsunami zone, but um, right, right. watching these videos. The size of the tsunami, right? <laughs> it's all relative. <laughs> um, and I went to visit a friend's house in uh, Newport, Oregon. So, you know, in the same area and, um, I said, I'm really glad that your house isn't like on the crumbling bluff yeah, because it's real pretty, but I wouldn't want to live there. And they're like, yeah, when we were searching, there was one in the backyard, like went under our feet a little bit, like was crumbling. <laughs> um, and so he like looked out and he pointed to where on the street in Newport, they not only have arrows for where to evacuate in a tsunami warning, um, they have on the street, like, this is where if you're above here, you're okay. Um, and so their house was above the little like street line. Um. Uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> it, it seems like everywhere I've lived, there's been something like I lived for a while when I was a kid in San Diego, and we had earthquakes and there was all this, you know, it's going to be the big, the, the big one. And then, you know, lived in the Midwest and we had, you know, hurricanes and uh, or tornadoes, so, you know, tornado siren would go off every, uh, uh, you know, the be beginning of the month. Uh, and then, you know, moved up to uh, Washington State out in eastern Washington and, you know, did the, the cold blizzards, that kind of thing. Uh, and here, like, I'm I'm way, well outside of the tsunami zone on the other side of the mountains. So until the Juan de Fuca uh, earthquake hits, <laughs> that's the big one we're waiting for. You know, we're, we're due a big earthquake. But uh, but yeah, living in the tsunami zone is it is that, you know, any minute we could have this weird natural disaster and. Yeah, it's, uh, that that would be wild, knowing, oh, yeah, our house is below the painted line. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I had a little moment um, where I'm like, you know, everybody thinks they're an above average driver. Everybody thinks that they're smarter than like the schmoes who get pulled out to see or whatever. Um, and I had this moment where I'm like having the realization that, you know, I'm not that much smarter than the average schmo um, because I was at Hasetta Head, um, which is, you know, they got a lighthouse. Um, and so I parked. And I'm up at the lighthouse um, looking inside and somebody comes up and says, oh, they're having people move their cars from the lower parking lot because the tide's coming in close enough. Um, and I thought, oh, dear. So I, I go down really quickly. I move my car to the upper parking lot. I come back. I'm rambling around in the park. And then as I come back down, it's right about, I think, then around high tide. And so I went into the now empty parking lot that was, you know, cordoned off. And I was sort of looking around, seeing would my car have been in danger? Was the tide coming onto the concrete? Like what's going on? Yeah. And one of the park rangers was kind of like, T -t 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 over here, over here. And um, motioning me away from that side of the parking lot because it's not the like constant waves, it's the extra wave. And so I was apparently within where an extra wave could have hit me. Wow. And I, I was in no danger, no no sneaker wave came up while I was either there or when I was back talking to the ranger. Um, but I was a little like, but I just wanted to see. Yeah. I was standing on dry <laughs> concrete. Yeah, it's dry <laughs> at that moment. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, and you know, and I'm sure the the rangers have a real clear sense of you know, you're you're standing on dry concrete, but I need to keep everybody <laughs> away from there. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. interesting. Uh, yeah, that's that 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 is uh, it, it is it's a different world than those of us, you know, kind of landlubbers are used to. <laughs> like, yeah, a parking lot that uh, is ends up underwater. Yeah. That's, uh... <laughs> So, but I do, I mean, you know, I, I don't want anybody hearing this to go, oh, I should not go there. Like, it's really cool. Go check it out. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful place. And so how, was that like a, a vacation that you took for a while or just a short skip? It, it was, 
It was about half a week or so. Um, my day job gets really dead Christmas to New Year's. Um, doing the editing, people have to do the writing first. And so if there's yeah. nobody around writing, then I don't have anything to edit. Um, and so I just, um, that was sort of like last minute, like where are cool places that I can go within driving distance of my house kind of yeah. place. And oh, that's Oregon's perfect. so pretty. So yeah, yeah. And there, and there are lots of those places that are very different. That's one of the things I love about Oregon. You can go, you know, oh, I'm going to go to Bend and it's a totally different feel than, you know, in, in central Oregon and, and, you know, kind of snow bunny territory. In, 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 <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't go to Bend place, you know, in, in December. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if, unless you want to ski, like, you know, that's, yeah, a, a cross-country ski. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's different feels in different places. But, uh, yeah, that, that that that's a great idea for a trip. And that, that's about the right amount of time. Like, I don't think I would want to go to Lincoln City for a month, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that that's that that's a, a lot of fun. And the, the lighthouses are really cool to see, too. Yes. Yeah, and, and all the little history. I love looking at history. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so wh what about hobbies? When you're not writing, what hobby takes you away from your work? Um, so uh, this is not a shock given what I've just said, um, but I do enjoy hiking. Yeah. Um, and and less about, because there's, there's, I know some hikers, which, you know, nothing wrong with it, are sort of like get higher, get steeper, get longer, camp, like that's sort of the uh, trajectory they're on. Um, and I'm very much more sort of like get enough in shape where I can get to the cool things. Right. Um, but then like, I just want to ramble. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite hikes uh, is uh, Silver Falls in Oregon, yes. sort of down near Salem. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm they have that the, at least once a year. It's a Yeah. The, all the different waterfalls. And it's, there's one waterfall that, you know, if you're um, have a disability or something like that, you can get to it right from the parking lot. And that's great. Really great to have that there. But everybody comes and looks at it and then sort of like walks back to their cars. Yeah. Um, and I love going on the trail that does have some steep parts to like go to all the other different small waterfalls. Um, and it just seeing different, um, getting out in nature, seeing nature, that sort of thing. But my sort of spin on it is that because my eyes are trained to find human made things for work. Um, I like looking at like, oh, there's a super old dam that's been abandoned, but you can see it's like sort of floodgates still kind of there a little bit. Yeah. And so I tend to walk through the forest being like, oh, cool, a squirrel. Oh, really pretty mushrooms. Oh, look, old concrete. That must be from 1910. <laughs> Have you ever done the Opal Creek Trail? As a, as a school kid. So I should I should get back on that one now that I'm an adult. There are these like there's old logging equipment that's a hundred years old or whatever, and you would love it because it's it's beautiful, you know, some old growth trees, and you're working your way till this beautiful little pond that's you know hidden way up in in the you know, but, but it's not a particularly arduous hike either. But along the way, you're coming across all this man-made stuff that is really really cool. I think you would just yeah, you would, you would <laughs> love that one. Uh, you know, we like. A, railroad ties and stuff that are kind of embedded in the ground now and you're going oh there was a line here for mm -hmm. hauling this lumber out and stuff so yeah it's it's some really really and and the, the machinery i mean is was immense in its yeah, time steam donkeys know, and, and stuff yeah and, and they just went this is too big to move we're just gonna let it rust <laughs> you know? yep. so yeah yep. that, that's one to check out but yeah i love silver creek it's a really well designed one so you can say today i feel like doing kind of 3k or the 6k or the 10k loop and seeing yeah. more falls and uh yeah that's 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 a great i highly recommend to uh any visitors to oregon do silver that in fact when people come to visit that's where we always direct them sure you know, if you want to get away from the kind of cliche stuff go to silver creek falls uh, and we never had anybody say oh we didn't like that <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, yes yes uh so yeah a lot of hiking and uh and the other you know uh one that we'd talked about previously was uh the columbia gorge highway uh, yes. which is a really cool one uh so where do you i mean i folks who've driven through the columbia gorge is the the kind of border between the states of oregon and washington mm -hmm. and it's so you've you know a lot of folks have driven it but where have you hiked in there um so on the oregon side um there was a highway that sort of went from a little bit outside um, Portland, if people know Multnomah Falls, and they often know Multnomah yeah. Falls, it's a little bit outside Portland. Um, the historical highway um, picks up right about there. And then it originally went 
for quite a ways. Um, I think as far as the Dalles or maybe even oh, farther. Wow. That's, um, that's and a long way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So on I-84, that's like a couple hours. Yeah. Um, and it was started in 1913, um, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then by 1922, the trouble was that they made this beautiful two-lane narrow road, and it exactly fit Model T's. And then Model T's um, start, sort of started, the cars did it bigger, more people had cars, and so it was just congested within even that time. Yeah. Um, and so they uh, kind of blocked it off and made a new road, and then in the 50s, um, they made I-84, and they even like took rubble from because i84 was a lot of like putting in um rubble and grade and you know out into the water um they filled in the old pieces of some tunnels in the historical highway um and later in the 90s i believe they went and they like um uh, took the rubble out of the tunnel and like sort of put in some shoring um and so now it's a bike and um, walking trail so and when, it's, you're, when it's you're hiking, up. you're hiking through those tunnels that are, yes. on, oh, how cool. Yeah, yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah. So it's this tunnel built in like 19, you know, 15 or something. And the um, Mosier Twin Tunnels, Mosier's out towards Hood River, which is not as far as the Dalles. But, yeah. um, and uh, there was somebody stuck in a storm, a uh, snowstorm in like 1922 or something like that. And there's this graffiti on the wall that they're very carefully when they were shoring it up with concrete and stuff, they like moved around the graffiti. There's this like so-and-so date of the blizzard or, or snowed in. And you're like, oh, wow, oh, wow, blah, 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 right? Um, and then I actually read about it. Um, they were snowed in for like a couple days and the train could, or the cars couldn't move, but people actually skied over cross country from local towns and like gave them food. So oh. they were by no means starving or like blocked in or anything. It was just, they couldn't move their car. So they were like hanging out in the tunnel until the snow cleared enough or was, um, they could shovel it enough to like get their cars out. So a couple days. So yeah. hardly the sort of survival situation. Yes. It's, it's not alive at that point. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not the Donner party. It's no. chosen to stay with our car rather than <laughs> head out with these skiers and stay in a hotel. Um, yeah. That's that is that, that that's my way of getting a, a lost in a blizzard. <laughs> I could handle that. Like I I, I picked this. Uh, that's that is awesome. So what else hobby wise uh, keeps you away from your writing sometimes? Um, so I'm uh, really into jigsaw puzzles. Um, in my old setup for my office, I actually had this huge stack. Uh, <laughs> it was like five feet high or something like that of different ones. Because when they're on sale, like you got to get them. Yeah. Um. But, uh, and people sometimes expect me to be sort of like some kind of like competition jigsaw puzzler. Um, and <laughs> I, didn't I know get there enough was competition jigsaw puzzling. Well, I don't know if there are competitions of people against people. I'm sure there are. There are competitions for Probably. everything. Probably. Um, but there are uh, puzzles out there that are like all white or no edge pieces yeah. or like they're all white on one side and then like they're all black on the other side. And then the like oh. die is like offset and there's like three puzzles in a box. Like I'm like, come on, that's no fun anymore. Yeah. That's that's like torturing yourself. I, I did one as a kid that was uh, five gumball machines buried in gumballs. It was so the, you know in this like cascade of gumballs, and so every piece was just colors. It was so hard, yeah. And, and you're <laughs> right; you get to the point where you go, "Why am I doing this tomorrow? This is not fun." <laughs> so what I do is um, Buffalo Games, favorite puzzle company. They have an artist um, called Amy Stewart who does like really bright, just sort of fun collages of like um, there's tin toys or. Um, rainbow animal plushes or or things like that yeah. um and so i do those and they're fun and they go quick um the other one that i like to do is um ravensburger who's a really well-known high quality um puzzle company they're based in germany um has a mystery puzzle series and so they are not quite like the box um they are similar to the box but then when you do the picture there's um little puzzles in terms of like brain puzzles um, in terms of thinking of like, uh, there's some squares over here and then the bottles are different shapes. And so there's square bottles. And so you're sort of looking at the picture to kind of put things together to come up with a final answer 
that's like a color or a word or something like that. But then what's solves. The, what's the, the name of that company again? Ravensburger, and they call them um, escape puzzles because they're they're a little like an escape room in that they're the type of puzzles you solve in escape room. Yeah, but you're not really escaping from anywhere. Yeah. So, that's I will put a link to that in the show notes as well. Yeah, I, t- I hardly um, recommend those to people. That's they're, they're very so cool. Fun. Yeah. So do you when you're finished with one, do you preserve it? Do you keep it in any way? Um. So the expensive ones I put aside to maybe do later. Um. But uh, a lot of times I try to send them to my friends, or I will just send them back out into the um sort of thrift store stream. Yeah. Um. Because I've got many a jigsaw from a thrift store in my time. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy to, especially um, during the uh, Panini, as it were, um, when uh, they were getting bought up in stores. Yeah. Um, and so I was sort of like when I'd find them in a thrift store and then I'd like send it back to the thrift store, like imagining that somebody else would be able to get it and do it. That's great. Um, and I don't mind missing pieces. I did a lot of thrift store puzzles as a kid and like one or two missing pieces, like, Okay. Part for the course. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I don't tend to like get heartburn about that. So. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That, that, that is a, that's a great model. You got to, you know, enjoy this thing. <laughs> yes. Pass that on to somebody. Oh, that's very cool. So uh, one of the things I always like to ask folks about on the show is, you know, the whole point is for readers to get to know you so they can say, oh, we really enjoyed hearing from Rhiannon. Let's check out Rhiannon's books. So if you were a Dungeons and Dragons character, what would be your race and class? Just as kind of an insight into who you are as a person. <laughs> so um, I, I feel slightly embarrassed because like, you know, sort of actual plays, sometimes people are like, I want to play something totally different mm-hmm. and like off the wall or like try this sort of like different rules, combinations and whatever. Um, but uh, Artemisia, my character on the Dungeon Scrawler's actual play, um, I it was one of my first characters that I was ever going to play in front of people. And mm-hmm. so I was very much more sort of my basic type. So I created her to type. Yeah. Um, so my base type of D&D character um, is a half-elf sorcerer. Um, so the half-elf for me is that um, I dislike when elves are too human. I like when elves are sort of otherworldly and have different priorities is the big one. Like in a long lifetime, you get different priorities. Right. And I don't necessarily feel like playing those priorities myself. Um, and so I like other people doing elves well, I don't necessarily want to do an elf myself. Yeah, yeah. But a half elf, I feel like gets a nice kind of crunchy, like not quite in either realm, but you have a little bit of that sort of feeling that like I have a little bit more time, um, but you still have the sort of human like impulse to like get things done, seize the day. So I, I like that mixture. And you also get that between worlds phenomena yes. of, you know, the, the and when you get into the kind of the lore and the backstory, like I am not fully in this world or fully in that world, but there's a lot to play with there. Yeah. And and how I was um doing her, depending on like which campaign setting or whatever, um, my character came from an area where half elves are well known. You also have half elves with half elves having kids, so then like there's that that mixture, yeah. so they have each other, and so there's not quite that so much. But I liked the idea that fundamentally, you have different connections to either parent. Because mm-hmm. I didn't do her with two half elf parents; she has an elf parent and a human parent. Um, and I really like the on the micro level rather than the um, larger level that uh, she has such a different relationship with either parent. Yeah. Yeah. And then you make a real strong distinction between sorcerers and wizards. So why <laughs> for you is it important for her to be a sorcerer rather than a wizard? Um, so I am a spellcaster forever and ever and ever. Um, I would be very strange for me to play some kind of fighter. I would do some kind of like warlock or something if I was going to go into melee combat. Um, and my thing about spellcasters is that wizardry fundamentally does not make sense to me. <laughs> in the whole like i'm gonna read it but then i'll remember it but then when i read something else i'll remember that instead and forget the first thing and so fundamentally i want my magic system to either be reading something in front of me or reading something or casting something that i have memorized that was once written down but like i memorized it like i'd memorize a shopping list like either of those like fine um or I like my spell casting to sort of 
arise and and be part of you and about you and your emotions and intrinsic and like all the cool sort of like what is it about you that bursts forth in magic and how can you harness it or encourage it or or whatever and that's all fun cool stuff but wizardry as D&D does it is this hybrid that just makes no sense where it's not about reading or memorizing it but it is and it's not about having it internally it's about just sort of like deciding you're going to do it and then doing it and like ah i just i dislike it immensely so, i will never play a wizard i i am curious so how does how do you think this translates into your writing that that the the impulse to have a magic system that kind of makes sense to you and to have it be emotional and and and, and come from your feelings as opposed to the 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 kind of you know, our, our arcana that is the, the <laughs> you know, the, the, this other, do you see any kind of connection oh, to your own work? Yeah, a hundred percent. I I like people exploring sort of what they have internally, their, their skills and their emotions and how they deal with them and, and things like that. Um, and so if you think I have my two main series, my um, urban fantasy werewolf series, and they're a species rather than like a curse or something. So there's no rituals or anything to do with it. It's it's part of their skill. They can mm -hmm. shape shift. That's a skill of theirs. So that's sort of intrinsic and internal to them. Um, and then with my space opera, um, the they have, it's be, being space opera rather than science fiction, just hard science fiction. When they have brain implants or whatever, the methodology behind it is that, um, you know, there's an implant on your brain, but it also means that you can sort of like telepathically or not telepathically, but like communicate yeah. people mind to mind, like that sort of thing, which for me is a similar feel of it's something you can do yourself. And do you have control of it? Do you like it? Do you want to shut it down? Can you shut it down? Um, and all those sort of interesting questions. Yeah, which I, you know, I, I think that that is something that is a great analogy for people who are very emotional and they can't hide their feelings. And you know, there are a lot of people who feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I am one of them. I, I can't hide this on my face. Like this is, you know, I, I am, I am wearing my brain implants expressions uh, <laughs> uh, uh, quite obviously. Uh, so yes. yeah, that, I think that's that that's that's brilliant. So, um, so your your character wandering through the woods and uh, ambushed by three. Uh, you know, level one goblins. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> well, it depends because um, if I'm assuming, like I started her at level three. So I think at level three, it would have been, um, I don't, don't remember she had lightning bolt. She's a lightning based character. But I'm thinking like, if it's me and it's not my character, I'd probably be doing the magic missiles because like pew, pew, pew. Yeah. I mean, it works. Very, um, very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> my character's up to level 18, I think. In our current campaign, they let us get pretty high because that, that's yeah. fun sometimes. Um, so she is a great lover of chain lightning. Ah, um, yes. <laughs> so that just like obliterates people. But yes. you can only use it once or twice, depending on your spell slots, which yes. is which is how I like those sort of things. Like, do you save it? Do you use it now? You like... <laughs> Just get rid of some, but then there are more, you know. Yes, you just or you just filled with a lot of regret because you did use <laughs> it and didn't you used it on the level one goblins in the woods? Yeah. And then there was something. Yes, I I, I totally hear that. But uh, yes, okay. So yeah, magic missile done for. <laughs> um, okay, well we're gonna go to our commercial break, and when we come back, I'm gonna ask you what you've been daydreaming about lately. Special announcement time. Not a Pie Publishing has always been committed to helping authors and readers find one another. Well, the show, which is all about helping readers get to know writers, just hit a milestone. 10,000 views on YouTube. So to celebrate, instead of charging authors to advertise their books on the show, I'm going to run your ads for free throughout 2024. If you want to make a 30 to 60 second video about your book, let folks know what it's about and where to find it. And don't forget your name and the title. Uh, I'll run one or two of those in our ad spot each week. Just send an MP4 file to the Not A Pipe email address in the show notes. Let's fix up some readers and authors into reader relationships. 2024, more readers, more writers, more books. Hi, my name is Marcella Stepper Darte, and my debut novel, The Hand of Fate, by Marcella Stepper Darte is an epic fantasy. The main character, Mira, is a foster kid 
who takes care of younger children. And soon she realizes she has to tap into power she never knew she had so she can protect those she loves. This is loosely based on Norse mythology and started out with me asking the question, what if? The Hand of Fate is book one of a trilogy. Book two will be The Hand of Ice and book three, The Hand of Fire. Please go to my website, MarcellaStepperDarte.com, to follow the links to Amazon so you can order your copy of The Hand of Fate by Marcella Stepper Darte. So, Rhiannon, what's something you've been daydreaming about lately? <laughs> well, so um, I was thinking about this, and I'm a little like, why do I dream about writing? Um, <laughs> but I, so right. to talk about that a little bit, um, daydreaming is important important part of my writing process um, in that um, I call it burbling. I've heard people call it noodling. Um, I, there's an article somewhere, I think on the CIFWA website um, that talks about how one author, uh, Rachel Aaron, Rachel Bach, those are both her, this pen names for the same person, um, got much better results in her writing sessions if she knew before she sat down what she was going to write. Um, and so she would like plan ahead. Yeah. Um, and for her, um, I don't remember if the planning was like uh, outlining down on paper, but for me, my planning ahead is very much in my head. Um, and uh, I'm going to start aging out of people understanding this analogy, but cast your mind back to the early 2000s, trying to watch videos online. Um, you needed to have them buffer before yeah. you started watching. Now it doesn't matter so much, but if you didn't buffer, then it got really choppy and you had to stop and whatever. And so my writing process is that if I don't buffer, I don't get much done because I'm, I don't know where I'm going um, on a micro level. Um, and so as I go about my day washing the dishes or driving somewhere or something, I try to do my buffering of my writing ahead of when I'm going to sit down that evening. Um, and then I know what's going to come out of my fingers. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is the sort of like, silly pie in the sky probably will never write it down like just throwing ideas around um there's a psychological concept uh, of play that's important even for adults which is that there's um no risks or consequences you just sort of like play around and do some stuff and it doesn't matter um and ideas that are in my head that i'm not writing down i can do whatever wild stuff that i want um and throw some of it away because it's just actually it's really boring or cliched and then keep some of the little like um yeah nodule of what's what's good in it and do you feel like the the moment of writing it down is where it ceases to be like this is just play and now it's planning like it's you know yeah yeah or or sometimes like i'm like let's have a new novel idea. Not that I need to do that usually. Usually they come right. to me and I've got too many stacked up. But God, short yeah, stories. I had an uncle once say to me, how do you come up with ideas for books? And I was like, uh, I have more ideas than I know what to do. <laughs> That's not the problem. The problem is time. <laughs> you know? but, so uh, short yeah, stories, but... sometimes I need I need it. Yeah, a that's true. Um, and uh, I will sort of throw things at the wall and off the wall and weird and funny. And then once I get down to where I'm going to sit down, I do have a sort of like um, just ref refining process and yeah. that sort of refinement in the daydreaming is when it stops being planned. It becomes like, okay, I'm getting ready. And I'm thinking about things like there's magic. Is that going to be visible on the first page? Does the character have a goal? How do I state that on the first page? All that kind of stuff where when I'm like off the wall, I, uh, there's magic. It doesn't matter if they know. And do they have a goal? I don't know. They're doing some stuff, you know. So. Yeah. How, where do we do, you know, the, the, I, I uh, talk to my creative writing students about the concept of withholding. I know these things. When do I reveal this? And and kind of planning that out, that plotting process is is challenging. Did I did I did I share this too soon? And it would yeah. have meant more if I waited until chapter three to reveal this. Or do people need to know? No, this is an old folks <laughs> home with robots. That's got to be clear on page one. Like yeah. you know, that's uh, that yeah, that's that that's. I love the metaphor of buffering though. My my partner will say like in conversation when she needs a moment to kind of think about things, she'll go, "I'm buffering." 
<laughs> and then you know the idea and i i love that you know like we do we need to give ourselves the space to do that but yeah i'll be thinking about that in my own you know kind of process to to what extent am i just buffering so that the story yep. can come out in a flowing way rather than in a choppy way that's 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 beautiful um so what's what are some announcements what do you have that's coming up soon that we won't need to let the public know about um Oh, I see. Uh, <laughs> when I was thinking about this question, I like totally misinterpreted it. I see now. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, so um, an announcement of like something that's coming out um, is uh, Beneath Ceaseless Skies is an online magazine. It does secondary world fantasy. Um, so not our world. Um, and uh, Scott bought a novella of mine. And so it's going to be coming out in the um, science fantasy issue in February. So that's coming up and it's a novella that's very close to my heart um, because going to novella length let me really dig into the character relationships. It's um, a couple of sisters and their estranged mother, um, which makes it sound very literary. There's a lot of magic. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it let me really dig into that sort of like the thorny issues that you get around family. Mm -hmm. um so i'm really looking forward to it and also like i got to play with my favorite kind of magic system um which is far post-apocalypse assume that our world ended and magic sort of regrew in the ruins um and what do the people who do magic care if they find an old car right oh that's what do they think about this old car they they don't need cars they're going around and they're like magic floating boats or whatever um so uh that's that fun. that kind of aspect and so that'll come out in february of this february, year yes. so that's oh very cool so yeah we'll we'll uh um, and so who's the publisher that's in which uh publication so the the magazine it's an online magazine it's called beneath ceaseless skies by scott andrews what is the editor well what we'll do is we will post uh we'll post a link to that and then folks can check it out so that they're ready you know when that drops but uh you know hey subscribe to uh beneath his i'm sure they've got some kind of sub subscription oh yeah mechanism. definitely so yeah, no, the, um, that it sounds really totally cool. worth i want to keep an eye out for that subscription yeah that uh that sounds right up my alley that's very cool um, so one of the things we do for the show is uh, a weekly poll, and I admit I am not consistent about always putting the polling question out there, but even the, the the mechanism itself reveals something about you and helps people get to know you, even if I forget. So if you are if you had a polling question for the world, what would be your question for everybody out there? Okay, so um, this actually, it came up in an article um, that, that was passed around among my friends, and I have not been able to come to a definitive answer, so... It's very, it's very important. If it does go up, be sure to answer. Yeah. Um, people were talking about frowns. And so we've all read about frowns and we have this sense in our head of what a frown is, but it's like, how do you know if you're seeing the same color as somebody else who's named yeah. something a color? Um, some people, um, and I'm one of them, think that when you're frowning, it's about your eyebrows and your brow. And then also your your mouth does some stuff because your whole face is obviously involved and so your mouth is doing something. And I have friends who say, absolutely not. The frown is the mouth. Like why else would you say, turn your frown upside down? Right. And oh yeah, your, your eyebrows are kind of doing something. And so and the, um, the article was trying to link it to British version of American English, which is often where those sort of things come up, but that has not been my unscientific samples way of um dividing it like i can't figure out what it is um and so like i'm really curious like more widely and i and i will i will i think i i owned up to it i think it's the eyebrows yeah so when i imagine I, I, a frown it's about it's all it's this it's but not this, this is a particularly fun question because what I what I envision is people will read it and immediately start making facial expressions <laughs> and kind of analyzing where am I feeling that muscle strain in my face? Is it mostly in my mouth area? Is it in my forehead? You know, like right away as you were saying it, I was going, 
And I think mostly it's here for me rather than, you know, my mouth just yeah. is set. Uh, for the for the podcast listeners, my mouth is just a line <laughs> and my forehead is just a whole, you know, mess of of uh, contractions. But, you know, I could totally envision, I, I, I can think of individuals, this may just be individual to individual because I can think of people I know where a lot more of it is in their mouths. Uh, than 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 it is for me probably so that that's yeah that's interesting where <laughs> is the frown for you and is it is is the perhaps the kind of vagueness of the the term because different people frown in such different ways I also wonder to what extent there are some people who can not so much frown maybe frown is the wrong term but scold with their eyes <laughs> where they don't have to move their face. Yeah. much at all and you know that look you know <laughs> and 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 how much of frowning is potentially in the eyes although we tend to squint when we frown yeah so maybe that's not so much the the well, glare you know there's also there was some kind of like anger versus concentration like mm -hmm. when would you frown because i think a lot of frowning and concentration if i'm like thinking yeah. hard like that's a frown for me but some people think frown is only like they're angry and right. concentration would be i don't know furrowed brow or something yeah yeah, that's that's and this is a good thing for us to know because when we're working in, with just a text-based medium, how do exactly. we express this? You know, how do we say, "Oh yeah, she she frowned, but it was all in her eyebrows." She you know, she <laughs> frowned, but it was all in her mouth. You know, and that 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 might be some interesting characterization. Those two characters are now different people. Uh, so yeah, I I I'll, I will play with that. Um, you know, and then there are people who maybe are concentrating kind of frowning and it's mostly in their eyes you know I, i've noticed that there are some people where you can look at their eyes and eyes alone can tell you how much thinking is going on the kind of gears turning and then how much the eyes are kind of saying eh, there's not a lot of processing going on behind those <laughs> you know and and that's a great way to describe a character like they're you know somebody's eyes are revealing that they are really really thoughtful um although that i could now imagine a character where that is deceptive, you know, <laughs> where their eyes seem to be glazed over and it's because they're introspective. So I don't know, that's, uh, that might be something to play with. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm getting too close to process when not a process show. Yep. Uh, so what's something that you are looking forward to reading? Um, so it's sitting on my floor until the library takes it back and then I'll probably get it from the library again. Um, there's a series, uh, Rook, uh, Rose and Rook, Rook and Rose. Um, from M.A. Carrick um, that is just beautiful. I, I hesitate to call it epic fantasy because it, they're long and they're incredibly detailed, but the scope feels much more um, zoomed in on small people's uh, problems, but then have big repercussions mm. as opposed to you're trying to solve a big problem and this people army small fighting problems. that army. Yeah. Um, and so it's definitely fantasy. Don't know if it's epic or not. Um, but I read the first two and I love them so much. I'm in the sort of like, if it's there waiting for me, it's perfect forever stage. Yes. Labyrinth's Heart is the the third in the trilogy. And I'm like, oh, I want to be like, not tired at all and just to sink into it. Nothing else going on in my life. And I'm going to like wise up eventually because that's never going to happen. Right, um, right. <laughs> but I totally but understand so that. Looking like when you've been it. looking forward to something enough, you're like, I want the experience to be perfect when I sink into this world. And then at some point you'll go, I just need to escape into that world. I love that world. Yeah. So. Okay, that's great. Well, I'll put a link to that as well. Labyrinth's Heart by M.A. Carrick. So that's yeah. a good one. So where can our listeners and, and viewers find you online? Um. So I am on various socials kind of like the social landscape is tough right now um, yeah. um uh at rhiannon held is twitter and blue sky um uh rz held writer i believe is my instagram not that i post there um but i have it because you never know which way you're gonna right. break um the easiest thing i would say is to go to rhiannonheld.com um, and, uh, it's got my, um, books and my newsletter sign up and I promise not to spam me with my newsletter. I'm a newsletters only when I publish something new kind of mm. gal. Um, so sign up for that. Um, and, um, I am also, uh, part of the dungeon scrollers channel. So you can see me and see my face and see me talking, um, on Twitch. Um, we do, uh, mostly, um, our, uh, regular game Westgate Irregulars on Twitch, uh, 630, um, Pacific time, um, uh, Wednesdays, 
Uh, so um, come and stop in and see if yeah. you like. See is, if and you like and so that's display. that's weekly. That's every Wednesday. Yes. And yes. Uh, and how long is that? Do you do it by seasons? Do you take a break, or is it every Wednesday? Um. So we were doing every Wednesday for we have a lot of back episodes. Um. And now. Um, we finished off the sort of main arc of the characters that ended up being about three seasons in a bit. Um, and then now we're in a sort of like uh, fewer of the characters are in a sort of side story arc to, yeah. and that should finish up um, in, well, the holidays sort of screwed up our timing. Right. So it's supposed to finish in February probably. Um, and then I will probably be playing less on that channel for a while. One of our, um, original uh, members is going to do a new thing that um, the affairs of wizards, I think it's called. Um, so he's running a campaign that that'll be cool. We're, we're having different people DM. Nice. Um, oh, that's fun. So have you ever done the DMing? Um, I have DM'd episodes. No, I, um, I that, uh, that's something I've never done. And I, I think, <laughs> I mean, it, it requires a certain kind of uh maybe maturity is the word the, 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 that i lack <laughs> the ability to say to these you know brilliant people go in your own direction and i'm not going to try and control this like i think <laughs> i as a writer i would be going but no i spent time planning this and i really need you to do this so that the story goes in this direction <laughs> and so i i don't think i would be a good dm but uh you know i i have a immense amount of respect for good dms <laughs> <laughs> let the story go where the characters are taking it you know yeah yeah my, mine are a little sort of like baby's first dming no combat just exploration mm. but they're up on youtube um and i like to point people to them um because they are archaeology based um oh, the characters cool. meet some archaeologists and sort of go into a ruin and explore a little bit um and so it whenever anybody's like archaeology how do you do that are you running from boulders um uh, yeah. I'm like, no, no. In <laughs> fact, I have a D&D game that I can show you how you role play archaeology. <laughs> yeah, I would be interested in that. Yeah, my, my understanding is archaeology is far less running from boulders and far more toothbrushing dust. Like, it's it's a very meticulous, but, thoughtful, slow process. But knowing when to toothbrush and when to get in the backhoe. Mm. That's the key thing. Sometimes yes, you toothbrush yes, and sometimes you backhoe. You cannot toothbrush at all, but don't destroy things with the backhoe. Yes. That's... Yeah. So your archaeology experience, I, I'm interested in this. Was this you know how did you how did you get into that and what was your experience doing that um so my uh, master's is actually in archaeology um and i never did a lot of um field archaeology so i'm in the um field of sort of compliance archaeology or um it's called internally cultural resources management um and uh so rather than academic archaeology academic archaeology tends to much more be sort of like we have this hole in our knowledge. Can we find something to fill that hole? We'll go and we'll very carefully sort of explore this question that we have. Um, and compliance archaeology is we're going to build a wastewater treatment plant. Is there anything on that plot of land that when we break ground for our wastewater treatment plant um, that is going to be harmed by, um, you know, our shovels? And everybody's like, oh, burial grounds. But it's not just burial grounds. There's a lot of sort of different traces of people. And it's not just Native American people either. Um, they're uh, the sort of on the West Coast, you don't have the time depth with your American people, but um, marginalized people, sort of like the um, Chinese who yeah. are on the West Coast to be building the railroads or whatever. The Chinatown area, um, we don't really have much written history about what went on there, but we can look at those artifacts and sort of know, get to know their life. So um, marginalized people are really good to have their archaeology about too. But anyway, so our imaginary wastewater treatment plant, the reason I use that uh, example in specific is like, you know what? We need that. Yeah. I want that. You want that. Right. We all want the wastewater treatment plant to come online. So it's not a matter of archaeologists going out and being like, how can we stop this wastewater treatment plant? We want it too. Um, so it's much more sort of like offering solutions. Yeah. Like, okay, move it um, 300 feet to the west, cave that part. The stuff that's under it will be saved by the paving. The basement you need to dig is going to be dug somewhere. There's nothing there. Hooray, we all win. Yeah. Um, and so I got into that, that kind of archaeology. And rather than being in the field um, 
digging the test holes to sort of see what's in the soil profile. Um, I was in the lab cataloging artifacts. Um, and I then transitioned into um, editing the reports that are produced because it's all very well. Um, I think there's a Mythbusters quote about that's the difference between science and screwing around is mm -hmm. writing it down. Um, <laughs> and yeah. the difference between like real archaeology and just digging holes is um, recording it and putting it out there for other people to be able to use that information. And so now my part in the sort of chain of like getting the science out to people is to make sure that it's presented in a way that people understand it. Yeah. Um, Cause if we're writing up a report and we're like, and people are like, why does that matter? Why do we care? Actually, I just want to dig through that because it doesn't sound very important. Um, you want to write it up so you're like, this is why this is cool. This is why it's really easy to move over here, like that kind of thing. Yes. So. The, we've got a, a, a an area right near my community. I'm in Independence uh, outside of Salem. And uh, so we're right on the Willamette. And the, the if you just go across the bridge, across the Willamette, there was an area that was where people who worked in Independence and in the fields around in this area uh, as part of the Braceros program. Mm. Uh, and their homes are there and rotting and emptied because at the end of what would that have been World War II, they were deported. They were forced out of that community. And mm -hmm. in some cases, families chose to stay and moved into town. And in some cases, and so, the, you know, this is a deep part of our community uh, because there are many families that are here who can say, oh, yeah, my, you know, my great grandfather lived in that house and worked in that community. But the houses still exist as kind of, you know, these, I, I think you would just find it this fascinating archaeological find. And then oh. the kind of question is, would people recognize the value in preserving that? Or are they yes. going to go, hey, hey, here's land on the side of the river. Let's, you know, let's build here. Well, mm -hmm. there was a community that was there and then was forced out. I think that would be really up your yeah. alley. Yeah, I so love that's it. yeah, that's uh, luckily we have marvelous history teachers at the high school where I teach oh, who are trying to teach students how to do that research, how to do that <laughs> documenting to say, hey, this is this is something that existed in our community and we should remember this you know, <laughs> rather than we're just going to let it rot on the side of the river and forget that the, there was a whole community of people who lived here. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's very cool work. And and do you find that the 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 documenting is then taken kind of into the academic world. So there people are, are are connecting the the work that you're doing with other work in terms of the sociology and kind of historicity of Greater Portland. Um so it's a work in progress. Yeah. Um and it it definitely helps, I think, um the as people sort of see what's coming out of, um, it's called gray literature often because it hasn't been published in official like archeological journals or something Is it like, like as that. opposed to a white paper. Is that yes. the distinction? Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, the more that sort of academic archeologists get into the habit of looking into that, um, I think is, is good. And it's, it's helping, I think nowadays because, you know, everything's going digital and that's so useful throughout yeah. the whole field um and each state has an archaeological kind of like state agency in the state government somewhere and um oregon and washington both have that information online and you can't just roll up and look at it because there's a real worry that people would try to find places to loot mm -hmm. um but if you have some kind of credentials I like you're not hired even thought of that but it makes sense people would go yes. where you're you're telling me where to steal yeah. oh that's wild i'm sad so archaeological information is exempt from freedom of information act requests because it's basically a map to steal yes. uh, from you know cultural groups that's really really fascinating yeah so if you have the the credentials you know if you're working for a sierra company working for a university you're working for a tribe um you can get access to the database um, and then um, you can sort of look at what uh, stuff has been done and they try to digitize it, put it on the map. And I think that is is sort of bringing people into sort of seeing like, oh, there's other stuff, you know, that's been going on. Um, mm. and, and even like, I will say, um, I'm not as familiar with Oregon because I was living in Washington for a while, but Washington has a members of the public can look at this kind of thing. 
And that's for buildings because buildings like they're there, you know, they're there. It doesn't matter if you know this building was built in 1910 or 1911. If you look it up on the database, like it's in no more danger than it already was. Um, And so they'll have parts of the database about standing buildings that are available to the public. If you want to look up, if somebody has sort of written a history of your favorite building downtown or something, it's there for you to look at. Oh, I've got a friend I'm actually going to tell about that who's really into like, you know, what is the oldest building in Portland or Salem or whatever. And, you know, learning the family history of this, you know, mansion on the, you know, she would love that. Uh, And that and that's accessible online. Um, Certainly in Washington, uh, if you want to look it up in Oregon, um, what you want to look up is the Oregon State Historic Preservation Office. So SHPO, we call it SHPO. Um, and their website has all kinds of useful information. Oh, I'm, I'm, th- th- this will be a belated birthday present from my <laughs> friend Amanda. She will love that. Uh, that, 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 that will be right up her alley. Very cool. Um, okay. So, uh, who is somebody when you're thinking about, you know, this show, who's somebody that you recommend I should have on this show? Okay. So I don't, I don't remember if you've had her before, but Aaron M. Evans. I haven't, is... but I will. She's on in a couple of weeks. Excellent. Yes. So tell everybody about it. We'll build some buzz for her. Yeah. So the buzz for Erin M. Bevins um, is she used to write D&D novels. Um, and now she writes her own original novels. Um, the first one is out. Um, the second one is in pre-order. They are amazing. Um, and the reason they're amazing is because they're epic fantasy, but they're epic fantasy about people, which is the part that I'm super into. Um, and um, she is so good at making things so detailed yet it all interconnects and it all works and people's motivations are just, you can totally see why they did that. And she has a little sort of aspect of mystery to it. Mm -hmm. And you can see where it sort of came out of D and D that sort of in the beginning, like the lore can kind of be a bit of a kludge and like everybody doing their own thing and trying to make it work. And Aaron has this talent of taking all these disparate pieces and like adding a few more. So then it clicks into into place and then it all works all of it and it's just it's beautiful if you're into like really intricate kind of lore and not to leave behind people who aren't so into like the world she does such great like emotional like punches with the characters as well like it's the twofer is it one of there are certain writers where i'll read them and go this person is clearly a planner rather than a pants <laughs> like this was done with such care you know this person had this all you know plotted out uh in in this kind of you know clever way that i that i admire i i i, I tend to become a planner halfway through when i get stuck in the swampy middle uh, but uh, sometimes <laughs> you know i'll read somebody and go this person knew where they were going and and maybe not you know maybe they 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 had that in their head but uh yeah i, I do admire that when i read something and think this this was really <laughs> intricately done uh, do yeah. you know uh have you ever come across eric witchy any of eric's work um so he's very involved in the lambert writers uh there in portland but he lives actually uh in salem and uh teaches a lot of classes uh, just a, a you know a comp- very accomplished writer, especially in short fiction, uh, but uh, uh, also a wonderful teacher. I really need to have him on the show as well. And one of the points that he made in a session that I was attending was that every story should also be a mystery story, uh, that we need to be thinking about what is the mystery and mm-hmm. what is that experience for the reader. And, you know, I, I, th- I think about your, you know, your your robot cozy. Uh, that's, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, d- do you have the, do you reveal, to, to what extent do you reveal that it is a mystery on page one uh, is, is an interesting question, but I found that very helpful, you know, to think, oh, is this sci-fi story I'm writing sufficiently a mystery also, you know, and that was, that was helpful to me. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited to have Aaron on. That would be really cool. Um, okay. So there's some folks I have to thank before we give our kind of final advice to the, uh, the viewers. Uh, thanks to uh, the artist, Max Oakland, who reached out and provided one of his songs for our intro song. I prefer the desk. Let Max know you like it by following him on Twitter at Max Oakland with three Ds. And thanks to Halizna CCO for their song Kids for the ad break. If you're in a band and you'd like your song used on the show, I'd love to highlight a listener's work like Max's song. So email that to the not a pie publishing at gmail.com uh, uh, address. Thanks to Doug, the producer, for making the show sound good and taking the blame when it doesn't. All your fault, Doug, if it uh, doesn't sound great. 
And I cannot forget to mention, Writers Not Writing is a production of Not A Pipe Publishing. So please go to notapipepublishing.com and check out the amazing books written by writers who didn't procrastinate too much. If you like this show, rate and review wherever you found it. Please check out Rhiannon's story coming out, or novella coming out in February. Uh, what's the title of that one again? Um, Twice Marked Wild Against City is yes. the title of the story. Beneath Ceaseless Skies is the magazine. It's the magazine. I am, that sounds really cool. And I'm looking forward to this, uh, the, this novel you're working on now as well. Um, and just check out Rhiannon, uh, RhiannonHeld.com for uh, all of Rhiannon's work. And then please give the, the things you find there a nice review. Click on that fifth star. It makes a big difference for authors. It doesn't take a lot of time and you'll make Rhiannon's day. So please, uh, you know, give those reviews. And similarly for this show, click on that little thumbs up, uh, you know, uh, give a nice review. Uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. So Rhiannon, what is some advice you would give to our viewers and listeners going into their week? Okay. Um, I would say, just remember that old things are cool. Old things are all around you. So look down at your feet, look up at the buildings and keep your eyes out because there's some cool stuff to find. Uh, totally agree. And then I always say to viewers, uh, a book without spaces would be gibberish and our lives need spaces too. So don't ignore the spaces. And third, no matter how, how much you procrastinate, we're still proud of you.